in Nashville, Tennessee at Vanderbilt. Uh, we get nice spring weather, no rain here yet. <laughs> yeah, it's sunny here. I'm in Georgia, um, south of the airport, but it's, it's nice. I haven't stepped outside, but it looks nice. And I'm in sunny California, so there's no storms here. Yeah, must be nice. <laughs> yeah, jealous. <laughs> So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so to be cognizant of everyone's time, uh, thank you for coming to the uh, Journey to Psych panel with um, Dr. Rihanna Mason from Georgia State University, Gwena Blandin, um, my um, former cohort member and colleague <laughs> from Virginia State University, um, and Dr. Uh, Dwayne Watson from Vanderbilt, with it being moderated by Dominique Lloyd at the Chicago School in Los Angeles. And I'll let her take it from here. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for Black in Psych Week. We are excited to kick it off with our first panelist, Journey to Psych Talk. Um, like she mentioned, I'm Dominique Lloyd. I am a doctoral candidate at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology in the Clinical Forensic Psychology Program. We have um, three lovely panelists that will discuss their journey um, to psych. So I will start off with uh, Dr. Watson, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure, I'm uh, Dwayne Watson. Um, my, uh, I'm a professor in psychology and human development here at Peabody College at Vanderbilt University. Uh, and my area of research is um, psycholinguistics, language reading, uh, and prosody in speech. All right, thank you. And then Dr. Blandon. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Blandon. Um, again, like Dr. Kindlebrook said, I am a proud member or a proud graduate from Virginia State University where I received my PhD in clinical health psychology. Um, some of my clinical interests include um, children and adolescents, more so focusing on trauma, um, conduct behaviors, and um, gender wellness issues. Thank you. And then Dr. Mason. Hi, I'm Dr. Rihanna Mason. I'm at Georgia State University. I'm in the College of Education and Human Development. I'm a research scientist there at the Urban Child Study Center. Um, my background is in psycholinguistics as well. I study um, vocabulary acquisition, vocabulary assessment, reading comprehension, because my roots started in an eye movement monitoring lab. Um, and also happy to represent Psychi today as part of um, Psychi's Diversity Advisory Committee. That's beautiful. We're so welcome to have you guys. I'm just overwhelmed just to see more faces in the psychology and doctoral room and it's just amazing to see that we can have these discussions and provoke you know this uh motivation for other black students to like get into the doctoral realm um it doesn't always have to be clinical like i might be clinical but other people are very well into research and that's important just as important so it's good to have these conversations so let's talk, um, let's start with our questions. How did you find your sector of psychology? Um, was it any pivotal life moments or training experiences? I can start off with you, Dr. Mason. Sure, so probably like many, I had a winding journey. <laughs> um, when I was small, I originally wanted to be a cosmetologist and then shifted to wanting to become a defense attorney. Um, when I entered Spelman College, I was a psych pre-law major, um, but then found out that I was more interested in, um, instead of just trying to use the law to prove that someone was innocent or guilty, I was really into science fiction and um, virtual reality, was watching these movies and it turned out that I really wanted to understand how the brain worked and how um, different sorts of mental processing 
um, occurred. And so I dropped pre-law and ended up as a psychology major. But career-wise, I didn't really um, wind up focusing on experimental psychology and cognitive as an area um, until I had had some training. I was part of the National Institutes of Mental Health Careers and Opportunities and Research Program, or NIMCOR. And so NIMCOR exposed us to different opportunities within the field, and I was able to see different aspects and kind of narrow down um, what really interest, interested me. And I still think, um, you know, I can say later about my hurdles, but I think getting exposure to what each subdiscipline actually does early, you know, helps us figure that out. So I'm very eclectic now still because I think, you know, I didn't have enough of that early on. That makes sense. I definitely can relate to that. All right, Dr. Bladen. Yeah, so for me, um, again, another windy road, windy journey to get to where I am today. But I think for me, a lot of it was I knew that I wanted to help people at an early age. I love to talk to people. I love to try to figure out everyone's problems. Um, big listener. I prefer to hear other people than to hear myself. And I knew that was something that I wanted to make sure that I did um, as I got older. But I also had this very strong passion to work with kids and adolescents. But I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do and didn't really know that that was a part of psychology until I got into high school where, you know, I started my first um, intro to psychology class. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. I always say you either love psychology or you don't. <laughs> um, and for me, I loved it from the first minute um, I opened the book. And I think in that moment, I knew, okay, psychology is something I want to, you know, um, further explore, but still didn't know what I wanted to do in terms of with kids and adolescents. And it wasn't until my first year of undergrad um, at Ohio State, where I was volunteering at um, the county family services, um, child and family services, where I was a volunteer working with at-risk youth. And for me, something that really um, struck a nerve is when adults always said that there is a bad child or there is a bad teen or they're troubled. And for me, that really didn't sit well with me. Um, and as I became a volunteer and I worked with some of these more challenging or troubled kids, I realized that they're not bad. <laughs> um, they're not troubled. Um, however, it's just more so something that one, they might not know how to communicate things or they're not getting the attention that they are looking for, their love that they're looking for, the support they're looking for. So in that moment, when I started volunteering, I knew right then I said, this is what I want to do. I want to work with kids and adolescents who, you know, may not have the best walk of life. They may not have the best um, families or parenting styles to kind of help them with some of their adversities that they're going through. And I wanted to be kind of that middle person where, you know, I still look like I'm probably a teenager, so I can relate to them a little bit, but also I can still connect with the parents as well to kind of help bridge that gap or that miscommunication. So, you know, after that, I guess we can say it was history from there where I just, you know, ran with what I loved. And in graduate school, I made sure I, you know, stayed focused in terms of where I wanted to go to get that exposure. And I think like Dr. Mason said, in terms of just going into different um, exposures, if you will, to see what you like, what you don't like. And I was able to work in a number of different settings with both children, adolescents, as well as adults, uh, where I was like, ah, I don't really think I want to work with adults. So, um, but I have to work with the parents. So, you know, some of those skills were good to be able to communicate with them. So all in all, that's kind of where I um, started with all of that. That's beautiful. Thank you. And then Dr. Watson. Um, I think I had a similarly winding journey. Um, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a psycholinguist. And I absolutely did not know what that was. Like when I was a kid, you know, I was, I was on a plane once and I told uh, the person next to me, I was a psycholinguist. And he said, oh, so do you like analyze people's personality based on their writing? And I'm just like, I wish I did, because that sounds cool. But no, so when I went to college, I um, was interested in medicine. And 
you know, I took a few psych classes and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm way more into this. Uh, and I got kind of interested in clinical psychology because that was sort of related to, to medicine. And as I took more clinical classes, I realized maybe, you know, I was like less interested in helping people uh, and, and sort of more interested uh, on the research end. Um, and I had the opportunity in my junior and senior year to participate in a program that was run by the Mellon Foundation where you could actually do research, they pay you to do research over the summer. Uh, and it was aimed at um, uh, underrepresented groups. And so I did that and that kind of cemented, I, I just really loved um, academics. I loved it all, the classes, the conversations. Uh, and I ended up in linguistics um, by taking an intro to linguistics class. And it, it blew my mind that, that language seems so uh, highly organized and yet part of the human cognition system. That was very exciting to me. I'm also a big nerd and was interested in, in sci-fi and sort of questions of artificial intelli intelligence and cognition and neuroscience. And so that kind of guided me into psycholinguistics. And so I went to grad school uh, to pursue uh, questions on how people use language. Wow, that's amazing. And I think what uh, Dr. Mason said, it's very important for you to learn the different subfields of psychology because you would never know. Like I, to this day, I, or when we picked you as a panelist, I never knew anything that um, you can be in that field of psychology and research things like that. That's amazing. And I think that's why it's very important to have these conversations so people can understand there's so many different fields in psychology. So many people working in the back that I'm saying like in the back where nobody can see them in the research, doing things that's so important that, you know, it should be highlighted. So, you know, people can see that there's so many things you can do in psychology. It's not just clinical face-to-face -face therapy. That's very important. All right, what challenges have you managed to overcome and are you still facing during your journey? So I'll start with you, Dr. Bladen. Yeah, so um, one thing that I hear from a lot of people, especially my parents and some of my mentors were, was that, if this was an easy journey, um, everyone would do it. <laughs> so we have to expect that there's going to be challenges. Um, I can say one of the hugest challenges for me was going to um, a school that was fairly new. So what that meant was it was still working on accreditation. And for me, not really knowing what that meant, um, you know, I had to learn as I went. And some of those challenges included, you know, some doors being closed, such as, you know, not being able to get certain internships or not being able to get certain fellowships. And for me, it was a little bit of a, a downer at first, but one thing, and I'll, you know, get into my mentors later, but one thing that I had to get instilled in me was you're going to have to, you know, work with what you got. And, you know, my school, um, was very much a great school. It was a great um, curriculum. And I just had to learn how to, um, really how to promote myself and how to advocate for myself and be able to get those internships, get those fellowships that other people from accredited programs got. And at the end of the day, God blessed me enough to get those. And, you know, it's really, um, it says a lot about, you know, me as a person and as a um, professional, but also from a school that, you know, might be looked different, you know, looked upon differently because they are from an unaccredited program. And for me, that was just something that was huge just to advocate for myself and to say, hey, I do this, I do this. And I had to work 12,000 times more harder than a lot of people. But that was a skill that I appreciate so much now because that's the real world. And, you know, you're going to have a lot of challenges in life and you're not going to be able to just sit there and pout and, and, you know, cry, but you have to, you know, try to figure out how to pivot through things and, and, you know, continue to make the best of it. And I would say a current uh, challenge right now is, you know, I'm studying for the EPPP and trying to get licensed <laughs> and trying to do that during a pandemic is, it's great. Um, but at the same time, um, I'm losing my mind in these four walls sometimes of, you know, just studying and not being able to get out and release and, and do fun things. So, um, you know, all the great things about psychology, but there are things that, you know, come with it. But I think that just is what makes your journey so much more unique. And it just makes you appreciate, you know, 
where you've come from. Yes, and definitely more power to you trying to study for the the EPPP during the pandemic. I know I make fun of the PAs that I work with. Like, you're not licensed yet. You're not licensed yet. But I can only imagine if I was in their shit. <laughs> I like to ruffle their feathers as they do me. But I can definitely, I would not understand. So more power to you and you will overcome and you will be licensed. I'm definitely claiming that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dr. Watson. Yeah, so I, I think one of the challenges um, that I faced during my journey, and, and now even a little bit, is sort of being the only one, you know, the only Black person in my unit, department. Um, you know, when I went to graduate school, I was the only Black person in my entire department, faculty, student, even staff. And, you know, that can be a, a very isolating experience. And I think in the world of in, in my area, cognitive psychology, psycholinguistics, um, uh, there, there's a lot less diversity. So there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, so when I started my first faculty position, uh, not at my current institution, but my previous institution, I, was, I, I went in to, to get my office key. And so I went to the basement to the person in charge of the keys and they looked up what, what, what room I was getting. And they said, you know, that's weird. Only faculty get those rooms. And, you know, I kind of look at him like, why don't you think I'm faculty? I mean, I didn't say that because I knew why <laughs> he thought that, right? So, you know, there, there's these little things that, you know, you, you, you kind of learn to navigate um, associated with being the only one. And, you know, I think even sort of now being pretty senior in my career, um, I still have those experiences, right? Um, you know, it, 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 it's not as bad now since you know, I'm a professor and, and my life is a good life, but um, it's still a challenge. Thank you. And I um, just want to make sure attendees, if you want, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will answer your questions. And then Dr. Watson, can you share um, your challenges that you have? Mason. Sorry, Mason. Um, I was going to say, um, like Dr. Watson, I've been the only in spaces. Um, but I think similar to what both other panelists have said, and going back to kind of the windy journey, <laughs> winding journey, um, having role models, um, I think is still a challenge. And it, it points to the only, <laughs> because there's it's sometimes hard to find someone that has the same identities as you doing what you're currently doing or you want to do. So I think going back to even how I was interested in psychology, my parents um, wanted me to go into medicine. I was interested in the biological sciences, took extra biology classes. Um, and even once I got into graduate school, this whole distinction between um, getting a doctoral degree and not being an MD was, you know, something I had to keep reinforcing. So yes, I am going to become a doctor, but I'm not going to be a, a physician. Um, but being able to show my parents and other family members, this is what someone like me is going to do. <laughs> um, and it's not too recently when we had the I Am Psyched exhibit come to the Southeastern Psychological Association, the I Am Psyched exhibit has pioneers in the field that I fell in love with Dr. Inez Beverly Prosser promoting her work now because I said, if I would have read her dissertation, she did a lot of what I am doing now and I can see my research in what she did, but I wasn't even aware that she was someone who engaged in the type of things that I'm interested in now. So I had mentors at Spelman, great individuals, their research areas were different. Um, and so finding someone that you can aspire to be like, you know, is still hard. So now that I'm at the point where, you know, I'm in the entrepreneurial journey, I'm trying to figure out how to use AI to automate some of the things that we've been doing by hand, transcribing audio files, not looking at um, eye movement data right now, but I'm still parsing uh, speech and looking for properties of words 
So who is doing that? Who can help me get to where I now want to be in my professional career? I think so that has been a challenge and is still a challenge. And having panels like this, um, I think, Dr. Watson, you said, oh, we need to keep this tweet because now we have so many individuals, we should be able to go back and find someone that we can network with and have these discussions. Um, and they may have been, you know, sharing similar experiences that we have, or at least we have some collective space now. So appreciate, <laughs> you know, this coming together and definitely will help others as they're trying to figure out what to do and how to do it. Thank you. And that that's very important because one of um, the attendees just asked a question. How do you suggest seeking or finding a mentor in this field? It feels isolating to navigate psychology at large, let alone academia, without invested guidance and support. So I think that's very important that we address that, especially because it goes with the next question of what role have mentors played in your journey? Um, Dr. Mason, since you discuss how mentors can be very important. <laughs> okay. I'm going to let Dr. Watson actually tell everyone about a database that exists that Spark put together, <laughs> but having resources, I'll, I'll let you, Dr. Watson, talk about that. But I will say, um, as part of the Southeastern Psychological Association, we had this leadership institute and two of the facilitators gave us some guides about goal setting and finding mentors. Um, when we think about goal setting, you have short-term and you have long-term goals. And so initially you want help with, if your main objective is to graduate, <laughs> then you need to find someone that is equipped to help you graduate where you are. Um, and so if you're undergrad, then working on the skill sets that you need to be able to succeed at that level. If you're a graduate student, going through all of passing your comps and doing whatever, um, you know, is, is needed at that level, as well as the research and as well as the exposure, you know, having all of that. Can, do you necessarily have to have the person who is a one-to-one -one match to your longer-term goal? I'm going to say no. Even when I was in graduate school, my advisor, when I came in, I told her I wanted to work with children. I knew I wanted to be in the school population. She said, well, that's not what I do. I can give you the fundamental skills of how to address the research questions, but you'll have to wait till your postdoc or when you're done to work with kids. And I was like, whoa. I can see now that yes, it works. And I was able to do a postdoc in the school setting. And I think I've been able to bridge well, but as she said, there are some fundamental skills that, you know, she developed well um, and had networks of individuals too, that once I got into the school settings that were helpful. So I definitely think looking at where you are and where you're trying to go, finding someone that can help you meet those objectives. And they may have to be different people. Um, so that's, I think my, my advice for everyone, look at where you are, where are you trying to get to, when are you trying to get to there and start kind of building this. People say for companies now you need a C-suite where you need that suite of mentors as well to help you for very specific things. Thank you. And then Dr. Watson. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think Dr. Mason's response was great. And, and, and I would just add that, you know, you know, like she said, it, it's very difficult to find someone who's exactly like you uh, in terms of long-term goals. And that's also true, I would say, for identity, right? And so for me, I've had lots of different mentors in different ways. So uh, my mentor in graduate school was a great mentor for research, um, uh, but he's like a tall white Canadian dude. Like he was like the opposite of me, uh, but in, in some respects, but I was, I was able to sort of work with him and, and get um, some great advice. Uh, in contrast, um, for sort of struggling, I, well, I won't say struggling, but sort of figuring out how to navigate um, psychology as a black man, um, I have a network of friends who aren't psychologists at all, but in their careers, they encounter many of the same issues that I do. And so having that resource, that group of people, that pool of potential mentors 
has helped me greatly, even if, even if you know, they're an MD or, or in business. And so I think being really sort of specific, you know, thinking about what your needs are uh, and like Dr. Mason said, finding a, a mentor that matches those is key. And now I will just add a commercial uh, because Dr. <laughs> Mason set me up. So I work with uh, the Spark Society, which is um, a society that is trying to increase the number of um, Black, Latinx, and Indigenous uh, cognitive, psychology, co cognitive psychologists and cognitive neuroscientists. If you're interested, I'm going to put the website uh, in the chat. But Spark Society has a database of junior and senior people that you can access through the website. And so if you're looking for a mentor, go there. Um, we also have a Facebook group where people say, hey, I need help with this, or I'm looking for a mentor, and then tons of people respond. So um, definitely feel free to use that as a resource, and I'll put it in the chat. Yes, please. That sounds like an amazing thing. And this would definitely guide everyone that's listening who needs those mentors, even myself that needs people in the field that can help you guide you. Like uh, Dr. Mason said, meet us where we are and how I can get to where I need to be um, graduating and taking the EPPP in my final steps. So um, Dr. Bladen, can you share? Yes. So the panelists have said some amazing things already um, that I do feel are very important. I think Dr. Mason, you brought up in terms of the identity piece and I, that really struck home to me as when I came in as a graduate student, I said too, I wanna to work with kids, only kids and teens, that's it. And my advisor was nothing of that. He was a neuropsychologist and hated kids. <laughs> and um, I said, well, how am I, how is this gonna work? <laughs> and um, it was very interesting in that he was probably one of the best mentors I've ever had. And I still, um, you know, talk to him frequently. I think being able to one, get those fundamental skills that you were mentioning is very important. Um, he was big into research. So that was something that was fairly new to me, but I knew I needed that to be well-rounded as a clinician. Um, also, as much as I hate, and, and I know if he's hearing me, he would just probably chuckle, but as much as I hated cognition and neuro, I knew over time that that was going to cross paths with me again. And now, you know, even with working with kids, even studying for the EPPP of how things are starting to come back. And I'm like, oh goodness, but I was so glad that I got that experience because I could have easily said, well, you're not doing what I'm doing. So I'm gonna find someone else. And although, you know, he wasn't a clinical, um, wasn't in the more clinical track, but he was able to, you know, connect me to people. He was able to connect me to a mentor in Richmond um, where I was able to build more of those clinical skills. And I think God places people in our lives for a reason. And I just felt that, you know, he's here for a reason for me. And, you know, now, like I said, I can say that, you know, I'm a really great clinician, but I'm also a really good researcher as well. And being able to have these resources, I wish I had um, a lot of this stuff when I was in school, I think that would have helped so much more. Um, but over time I've learned, okay, wherever I go, what is the things that I'm looking for? What, like you were saying, what is your end goal? Um, what are your short-term goals and who can help me along the way? There's nothing wrong with picking someone up as you go. And that was something I did and on internship. I found a mentor fellowship. I found four mentors who were all of my supervisors and it's just a great feeling to have to talk to someone who's been through it, um, talk to someone who can, you know, kind of help you go through different things. And that's something that I want to make sure that I do for the people coming after me as well, because mentoring is very important. I, I don't remember who said it, but this can be a very isolating, uh, you know, very <laughs> stressful journey and you cannot go through it by yourself. Um, so just having those people to help you and push you um, to be great and to be better is very important. So, you know, to have these panels and, you know, I see so many participants on here and it just warms my heart that we're able to have these, especially with people of color. It's really, I was blessed enough to go to HBCU for under, for graduate school, but I know how it felt to be that one in, you know, 300 of, you know, of, you know, in, in um, school. So it was just not, 
a great feeling to have, but just to have these little um, resources and outlets is really, really important. Thank you. And we're getting so many wonderful questions. I'm going to just pause with our questions that we have and start answering, um, let you guys answer these questions that the attendees been asking. So one of them was, what are some ways we can, or you have in the past, have used your position to provide opportunities to black youth coming up behind us to further diversity, to further diversity in our field? So um, Dr. Mason. Um, so a couple of ways. I have um, sponsored students um, at our center. And when I had the Tiva lab at Georgia State um, sponsor students for research in that way. So I've served as a McNair advisor, a RISE advisor, um, and NIMCOR advisor when the program was still um, operational. So that's one way. Um, I've also taught courses, so I didn't really tell you all the paths <laughs> that I took, but I started at Georgia State um, as a tenure track faculty member and then decided I wanted to go to a smaller institution where I had the opportunity to then build up the experimental side of what they were doing. And so it was a time where I knew Lots of students by name, not just those that were in psychology, because the campus was small. It reminded me of the feel that Spelman had, but I was engaged in their lives. So then I was also um, active in the Black American Student Association and um, did meals with the international students. And so just found ways to be visible. Um, my husband is a coach and also would go to games and, you know, support students in the other parts of their lives. Um, and then I don't know if you can see above my head, lastly, what I'm doing now to give back is part of this entrepreneurial journey, but you can see that this painting is the bottom part of the graduate. So that doesn't work to show you. Let me move over. <laughs> um, but uh, my colleague and I um, just recently published a book that's coming out in May but we've taken the time to go through some of these programs that have long-standing history of supporting um, underrepresented or minoritized um, individuals, capturing them, sharing them in an asset-based way, and then building uh, a database of these programs that's more interactive across disciplines and letting you be able to search for some culturally relevant and culturally specific programming. So that's a big way that I'm giving back now, knowing that everything that I've experienced from high school to now has come about because of the supports I've received um, for being tapped into, you know, different networks. So trying to raise awareness that they're at your school, there are things that you can get involved in and here's where you can find them. Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. And when you come out with that book, please let us know so we can tweet it, Facebook, put it on our website, everything. We would love to support and I would love to see that. Um, Dr. Watson? Yeah, so, you know, one of the, you know, I think for all of us on this panel, you know, we've tried to do works that help folks who are coming up from behind us. And for me, that's included, um, you know, having interns uh, in the lab, participating in programs that do have inter internships targeted uh, at minoritized groups. Um, I've had great interns from uh, local HBCUs, Tennessee State and Fisk, uh, working in my lab here in Nashville. Um, and, you know, I've you know, I have one hat where I'm a professor of psychology, but my other hat is associate dean of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And part of what I feel is it shouldn't all be on us to make, um, to clear the path, right? So I think communities in psychology need to work towards more equity and more diversity, right? And so I spend a lot of my time working to try to convince my colleagues to, 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 to really sort of uh, be intentional about um, helping students uh, who might not know about psychology uh, to have an opportunity to participate in graduate uh, programs. So 
Um, I think having those conversations is actually a big piece because it's the folks in power really that can make structural change. And um, I, I feel like um, in terms of impact, <laughs> that's, uh, I think that's kind of where it's at. So um, my advice is to, to continue these conversations. Thank you. And Dr. Bladen? Yes, so I would say that for me, I, again, have always wanted to make sure that I've helped others who come after me. And even while I was in graduate school, um, you know, the first years that would come in, I would always make sure to come to their orientation or come to, um, you know, different programs or different activities that they had just to say, hey, here's my number, you know, even if you just need, um, you know, a quick tour around campus, or if you need to know where to get a book, you know, those things go a long way, again, just to, you know, say, who, okay, you know, someone's here who I could talk to, to help me through this. Um, but also in terms of when I was in my research lab, I made sure to take extra time out of my day to help some students who may not understand um, protocol or may not understand how to do certain um, statistics. And I tried to make sure that I helped as much as I could with that. But even going back to high schools, going back to, um, you know, some of my old professors and just, you know, popping in and saying hi, and, and this is what I do kind of like now. Um, again, it's very helpful. And I think for me with being, um, you know, a little bit on the younger side of things to kind of say, hey, you know, here's some of the more um, current hurdles or current issues that are going on that, you know, I can be of help and I can be of assistance to. And like I said before, it's just something that is very um, important and it's crucial to have someone to kind of help you along the way. Unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of that um, in graduate school. I didn't have the mentor or the role model in front of me or that student ahead of me who took the time to say, hey, you know, here and, and all of that. And I think that I wish I did, but parts of me, um, I'm kind of grateful that I didn't because I was able to, you know, kind of navigate through things myself to see like, oh, okay. And, and also to feel like I don't want other people to feel the way I did. So I want to make sure that I can do what I can to make sure that I don't do that. So um, even with my fellowship last year, um, speaking with the diversity group and they were working with some of the um, element or the middle schools and high schools just to share in terms of what all um, psychology does and, and what a psychologist does. And those types of things I feel are very helpful. Um, like that book that uh, Dr. Mason was, I can, I'm very excited about that, um, just to, <laughs> um, you know, find a way to sharpen my skills and how to help. Because again, we are, as big as psychology is, we are such a small community um, and we all somehow will maybe bump paths. Um, so it's good to help as many people as we can. Yes, and I agree, like seeing, um, I was able to open up um, Dr. Mason's page that she put in the link and I'm like, that painting is more beautiful than um, anything, seeing it on my screen. I'm like, oh, that is gorgeous. So I'm definitely gonna, um, there's more questions. So let's get into it. Um, another attendee said, I have, I always have trouble trying to balance between being friendly slash personal versus being professional with mentors. Do you have any advice on um, the ideal balance? Also the same with my colleagues, coworkers, et cetera. So um, Dr. Mason, if you wanna start. So this sounds like setting boundaries. I'm not, I don't know if I'm the best one to give a lesson on boundaries because mine are very, um, soft. <laughs> um, I've always been one to give students like my cell phone number. Um, and because I'm a mother, I'm a wife, you know, sibling, I think about all the ways that we kind of live and exist in the world that makes us who we are, that I want to be accessible to most people that I encounter. So I'm actually working on trying to firm up, you know, my boundaries a little bit. But I think the best way is just to ask, just like a number of other things. You know, if you're unsure about 
should I call you Dr. So-and-so? Can I address you by another name? Or how do you pronounce your name? We just have to ask. So we have to start there first. And then I think whoever we're engaging with will let you know right away. Thank you. Dr. Watson? Um, yeah, I, I think Dr. Mason's answer is, was right on. I mean, I, I would just add that, um, at least in, in my life, the different mentors I've had had themselves different styles. And, you know, just finding out what those styles are, whether it's, hey, let's, you know, have a drink after, you know, lab meeting or, um, you know, we're going to set up a meeting uh, at this time at noon to talk about, you know, your promotion or what have you. Um, just trying to get a feel either by asking or just sort of talking to other folks um, about what this mentor is like, um, I think it'd be really productive, right? And I've, I've had really good mentor relationships in a variety of different styles. It's just sort of a matter of figuring out what the mentor's style is like. Um, and that, I think that's true for all relationships, right? Your colleagues and so on. Thank you. Dr. Bladen? Yeah, I would definitely agree with the panelists. Um, communication is key. I think for me, one thing that I eventually adopted as I did start becoming um, you know, a supervisor as well as um, a, a mentee and a mentor in terms of having that communi or having that conversation at the beginning. So in terms of my supervisors used to always say, tell me your 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 best um, supervisor and tell me kind of your worst supervisor and what that looks like. So, you know, for me, I was able to say, hey, I had a supervisor that checked in in terms of not just about my clients or my patients, but how's your day going? And little things like that, where it's not just about business, but I'm not going to, of course, tell you, you know, what I did with my girlfriends over the weekend. But, you know, just being able to have more of that um, personable relationship but again having those boundaries is very important but again having that at the be having that conversation at the beginning is just very important so that was something that I felt um, that I needed to do with my students or with my patients or my supervisees in terms of you know this is kind of how I am if this doesn't work for you that's okay and I can adjust and we can adjust together um, because we want to make this work you know because at the end of the day, um, I'm here to make you better and you're also here to make me better. So we can't do that if there's no communication and we can't do that if we're constantly, you know, having issues or boundaries are being crossed. And there are going to be times where boundaries are crossed, not, you know, intentionally, and that's okay. And then that's when, again, you have those conversations to say, hey, I maybe didn't like the way that this was addressed or how, you know, you maybe answered this question and that's okay. And you just have those conversations and you try to see if you can move on from that. Thank you. So we have a question that is particularly for Dr. Watson. Can you speak a little further about the program you participate um, in with the Mellon Foundation? And for all the panelists, are you, oh, and these are for everyone. For all the panelists, are there any programs, internship grants, et cetera, you would recommend for underrepresented scholars? Yeah, so I can, so the, this Mellon Foundation program, I don't know if it still exists because it was when I was an undergrad, like back when dinosaurs roamed the earth like 20 years ago, it was a while ago, right? So, um, but I will say that there are, you know, if you look, there are quite a wide variety of programs out there that I think basically do the, the same sorts of things like uh, McNair uh, is a route. Um, my own university is part of, a leadership alliance network that um, hosts interns at different institutions across the country. So it gives um, underrepresented folks a chance to have research experience, right? And that's and that's that was my experience. It was a, um, and and what got me into psychology. So I would recommend um, sort of looking into programs that are available for your specific area of psychology. Um, uh, the Spark Society plugs uh, programs uh, that are related to neuroscience and cognitive psychology, but I'm sure there are other programs in other areas of psychology as well. Thank you. All right, I'm going to try to fit two. Oh. Can I add something? Yeah, of course. Um, so 
if you all go to the website that I put in the chat, towards the bottom, there's a list of academic pipeline project book contributors and leadership Alliance is in the book. So the link to the leadership Alliance is there. FAMU has a graduate feeder scholars program that's relevant for psych majors as well. Um, Mellon May still has a program. I'm not sure if it's the same because they um, targeted like humanities and things as well, but the link is there. Um, so these are what we call the home, hallmark ones as they've been a, around for a while. Um, but there are a few other ones that I think we have in our appendix that I may be able to post later to give you all some, some other words. The way that this list is, is made does not have it sorted by which ones are for pre-collegiate, collegiate, graduate, or faculty. And we do have that available. So um, I will tell um, our web person to make sure that we uh, make that link available. I know we curated it for SciKai, and so I'll also try to go back and pull what we um, pulled for Psychon. Where is the, um, you said it's on the bottom of the page. What is it called again? Um, so there you see program listings underneath of, so you go to the picture, there's about us. The next section says program listings. Okay. And then there's a PDF of programs that are hyperlinked. Yes. And that has the information to Leadership Alliance and a number of others, um, even conferences like the annual Biomedical Research Conference for Minority Students has a lot of uh, programming that's included above and beyond the presentations. So. Um, okay, thank you. One of the attendees was asking, so I wanted to make sure she got that. And then. Uh... If there was... All right, one more. What advice do you have for non-traditional students? So MD to master's, considering a doctorate in psychology, um, what's the first steps? So Dr. Watson. Um, I guess what I would say is, you know, I think the first step is to think about if you really want to do it. <laughs> and I don't say that as a sort of discouragement, but, um, you know, PhD programs, you know, they're a challenge, like any kind of uh, professional uh, training. Uh, but once you've decided you want to do it, I would say, reach out to programs that you're interested in and try to find out what kind of student you know they're interested in, um, and I can only really speak to my area about this. But you know, I field questions from undergraduates who are interested, um, and uh, to applying to my to work in my lab uh, as a PhD. And I'm happy to answer questions about what the program is like, what kind of requirements we're looking for. So, I and, and I said undergrads, but really anyone who's interested in applying to um, our program. So I would say, don't be afraid to reach out to either um, uh, admissions coordinators uh, at programs that you might be interested in, or even the faculty uh, for programs that you might be interested in. Okay. And did anyone else want to tackle this question? Dr. Mason, Dr. Blaine? I would just say, just to piggyback off of Dr. Watson in terms of connecting, you know, sending an email to the faculty again, but do, really doing your research to see, um, you know, the faculty's interest to see if there's anyone that you feel you can connect to. And in that moment, then send an email. But even within that, see if you can reach out to some of the, you know, stu like graduate students or any of that, because sometimes the faculty is great, um, but you really get a lot coming from graduate students and just to hear their experience with things and just, you can kind of pick their brain as well. So again, it is a, a, a question you have to ask yourself in terms of, is this what I really want to do? And if so, that's awesome, but just make sure you kind of do your research and, and not just jump in. Um, because again, just asking those little questions um, will take you a long way. And I guess that can maybe help ease 
some of that for at least the first step and to kind of go from there. Thank you. Dr. Mason, did you want to add on to anything? I was just going to say, I wholeheartedly agree with everything that um, the other panelists have said. I'm just going to take a step on the other end that um, think about your priorities in life as well. A number of non-traditional students that I have helped find programs forget about their family um, obligations or they forget about, you know, I've been used to working and I have this budget when I go to graduate school, you know, is it going to look the same? So also consider what your life needs are. So are you willing to move? Oh, there's this fabulous program in Nashville. Is your family willing to go to another state? How is that going to work? And so I'm not saying limiting yourself to where you are, but just make sure you consider everyone else who's in your village. Are they going with you? Do you have support? You know, these other things that are going to make you successful um, when that great opportunity is, is there for you. Thank you. And there's so many questions. Unfortunately, I wish we can get to all of them, but I did want to finish with the um, question that we um, created for you guys. Advice for graduate trainees or aspiring trainees, what message could you tell your younger self um, benefit from hearing? So Dr. Mason, you want to start off? What would you tell your younger self or some advice? Um, hmm. Probably don't be afraid uh, to try new things. I think I have tried a lot of new things, but I've always um, had some reservations. So I think things that we've said before, um, because you might be the only one there, don't let that stop you. If you've never gotten on a plane at this point, be willing to try, you know, once COVID is over and all of that, but I'm thinking back to my younger self, you know, how far had I traveled? Um, you know, I was raised in Baltimore, went to school in the South, kind of stayed in the South. You know, I was accepted to graduate school in Texas, but I think part of me was like, mm, that's a, you know, far away for me to go, but just be open, be open, <laughs> open-minded. And then, Still, I'm telling myself now, practice good self-care. Um, so, yeah, I'm repeating that to myself now. A lot of things are happening at the same time, but we can't continue going on and being our best selves if we don't take care of ourselves, you know. And so that's a lot of different things. For me, it would be diet because that's what's creeping up on me now. I may not seem like, you know, I need to think about my diet, but salt and sugar comes back to, you know, haunt you later. So be careful of what you're eating when you're spending um, all nighters, you know, and all those sorts of things. So make healthy choices. Thank you. Dr. Watson. Um, so I, I think Dr. Mason stole my uh, comments, both the diet and I got to cut out the salt, uh, but also don't be afraid. Uh, to do things. Um, so that, that would be the big advice uh, to my, to the younger Dr. Watson, the pre-Dr. Watson. Um, you know, when I, when I went into undergraduate, I was really interested in, in, in sort of computer science uh, and, and coding. And I took my, I, I went to my first class and there were kids who had made their, like designed their own machine language when they were eight, you know, something ridiculous. And I'm like, I dropped that class. I got out of there. Cause I'm like, I can't do this. <laughs> this is crazy. Um, but, you know, I, I went to psychology, but in grad school, I was able to sort of uh, follow uh, and learn about computer science. And I'm like, I wish I had done this earlier. I was just afraid to do it. And what, what was the worst that could have happened? Um, so I think I kind of keep that experience in mind as I move forward, uh, even now in my career. Um, and the second thing, I, a piece of advice is to, is related to self-care, but learning to say no to things. Um, has been something I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, if you say no to the things you don't wanna do, it, it allows you to say yes to things you do wanna do, like me participating on this panel, right? And so I think um, sort of be strategic about what you can do. Uh, and that's part of self-care and, and taking care of yourself so that you can do the things that you find fulfilling. 
thank you so much, Dr. Bladen. Man, you guys literally took every single, <laughs> every single answer, which was amazing. But I would say on top of those things, um, one thing that I would make sure to tell myself is to be easy on yourself. Um, that was something really, for me, I know all of, a lot of us, if not all of us, um, we're hard on ourselves. Um, this field is a lot with imposter syndrome. It's a lot with, you know, am I doing this right? Or I didn't get the A that I know I could have gotten in undergrad or high school. And really just saying, you know what, it's okay. And it's more as I'm learning with this ECCP studying, it's about the learning experience. And it's more so of, you know, take it easy on yourself, you know, say I've gotten this far and I, you know, I just have to keep going. And I think that is a big part of self-care as well in terms of not beating yourself up for, for things and making sure that yes, you having a, a balanced diet, making sure you try to go to bed at a decent hour. I know I still struggle with that and I'm out of grad school. Um, so really just making sure that you try to be um, as, be as best of a representation as you can be, um, especially practicing what you preach. You know, we tell our, our patients, our clients all the time of, you know, do these things, make sure you're, you know, setting time for yourself and, and we're not doing that. So, you know, I had to take a step back and look at myself like, are you, are you even doing that? So um, again, take care of yourself. Um, it's becoming nice outside. I know some places it's nice all the time, but where I'm at, it, it's springtime. So it's nice. The sun is out. Go outside. Take a walk in between sessions. Really just making sure you have time for yourself because all of us want that degree done. <laughs> I know I did. So I just power through, power through, power through. But you're not going to be able to enjoy it if you are stressed. You're not going to be able to enjoy it if you're just, just drained and exhausted. So make sure you take some time for yourself. Thank you guys so much. I know I enjoyed myself this last hour. I don't know about you guys. I know the attendees definitely did with all these questions that keep coming in. So I hope you guys continue to engage on Instagram and Twitter any way um, possible that we can continue to have this conversation. It seems like we need another one just for all the questions that they were pouring in. It was so amazing. Um, while we still have a couple of minutes, I just want to highlight the rest of the week that we have going on black and psych um, thursday is another panel that we're doing black and psych racism our own lauren um, kendall brooks will be speaking and she will be moderating um, it would also have dr tally dr myers and dr edge they will be discussing about um, culturally relevant research practices um, and then we also tomorrow we have um, Black in Psych 2020 just share some of your experiences through the COVID we know that we kind of made it through the COVID but we made it through the toughest part being in quarantine and we were able to learn our self-care learn our boundaries learn what's important to us and really um, navigate through that set our stones and be um, try to be as much as we can so then friday thursday we have the panel and then friday we have black insight misconceptions so how does your family or friends think um think about what you do so you know so with psychology you always hear those people like are you reading my mind and you're looking like no i'm not <laughs> i just want to be my normal self so let's just have those conversations that we're having on Instagram and Twitter. You can also email us in Black and Psych at Gmail. And then Saturday, we have Black and Psych Resilience. Um, how do you survive? How do you cope? How do you thrive? So maybe we can just all talk about our self-care and get some new ideas that we can engage in and uh, make sure that we are successful in psychology and showing that Black people are thriving in psychology and other minorities too. Like we're here to stay and we're here to change the psychology realm it's not going to be just one color, but it's going to be lovely multicolored and multi-generational. So let's, i um, so happy. Thank you guys for all coming. And this was recorded. So there will be a YouTube link that we will post. 
And um, thank you again to our lovely panelists, Dr. Mason, Dr. Watson, and Dr. Bladen. I am truly inspired from hearing your journey to psychology. Thank you. And I hope you guys have a good day.